Hi, I'm Andrew, and this is Keen on Democracy. There are fewer more accomplished people in the world today than the former Czech ambassador to the United States, Vaclav Havel biographer, and lifetime human rights activist, Michael Jantovsky. So when I sat down with Jantovsky at the Havel Library in Prague, where he is the current executive director, I began by asking him what he was most proud about in his storied life. A chill is enveloping the world. Everywhere I go these days, the conversation is the same. Everyone is fearful about the fate of democracy in our digital age. The same worried question is on all of our lips. What or who is killing democracy? Everybody wants to know. There's certainly no lack of suspects. Trump, Putin's trolls, Mark Zuckerberg, authoritarian populism, the wall, Viktor Urban, fake news, Brexit, Bolsonaro, surveillance capitalism, Erdogan, Twitter, or last but certainly not least, the president of the People's Republic of China, Xi Jinping. So what's up with democracy these days? Is it really dying? Or is it simply shedding its industrial analog skin and updating itself for our networked digital age? That's the subject of this podcast series. This is a show featuring conversations about the most important issue of our age with some of the world's most incisive thinkers. I hope it both provokes and enlightens. Michael, what are you most proud of in your life? Well, I suppose that I'm 70 years old and uh, I'm quite proud of the fact that at 70 I can still get up every morning and look into the mirror. That makes me happy. What about your pride in your lifetime fight on behalf of democracy, you were one of the, the brave dissidents in the 60s and 70s who fought against uh, the Soviet bureaucracy. Is that something you wear with pride? How do you look back at those achievements in your life today, of course, in a free Czech Republic where you no longer have an overlord? Well, I did make a small contribution, a modest contribution in those days, but there were many other people who were braver and made uh, more of a sacrifice than I ever have. And uh, it came more or less naturally to me, not as a matter of deliberation or heroic uh, determination. I was 18 at the time when the Soviets invaded this country in 1968. And it was a moment that for better or worse made my life. I mean, I never had to worry about the pros or cons of communism again, about the pros or cons of uh, democracy and uh, dictatorship. I knew I was living in a terrible system, under a terrible system, that uh, was a, not merely a dictatorial system, but a totalitarian system, a system that wanted to control not just your political views and not just your physical movements, but everything about you, your family, your marriage, your children, your thoughts, your sexual life, everything. And either you adapt it and accept it, this kind of life in return for very meager rewards, or you resigned yourself to be a citizen of second category. Is that one reason why you studied sexual behavior as a student? Not necessarily. I mean, that came more or less by accident, as most things in my life. But I studied psychology and I was active in, in research, mostly dealing with motivation and the uh, drives and the uh, instincts and reasons that make people tick. And of course, sexual drive is one of the three most powerful drive of the human species. So that's why. So drive is all about agency, of course, human agency, human will. The way you just described the Soviet 
totalitarian system is one which tried to do away with agency. Is that fair? That's fair to say. And even more importantly, drives the innate instincts, reflexes, drives that we have are something we're born with. It's very difficult to modify them or change them or make them extinct. And the communists, the totalitarian system, believed that you can make a person to do anything. Why did they do that? Why were they so determined to crush human will, to crush human agency? Because they had a completely false idea of history. They thought they knew the end point of history and uh, they had to corrupt and modify everything that came before to fit the end point. And so they tried to brainwash people, they tried to re-educate people, they erased large parts of their own history and replaced them by completely fictional history, etc., etc., still didn't help. What is it about the Czechs that enabled them to make sense of and indeed to make fun of Soviet totalitarianism? I don't know another people in Central or Eastern Europe who were intellectually better equipped to see through the hypocrisy and absurdity of the Soviet system. I think you may have hit it on the nail. The humor is something that's often thought of as uh, specific to Czech nature and Czech nation. And of course, humor as other types of humor, Jewish humor, for example, are survival mechanisms, uh, mechanisms developed by groups of people who feel threatened or oppressed by a larger power, and they survive by making fun of uh, what they go through and also by trying to invent uh, alternative uh, truths or alternative stories to fool their oppressors. So a nation of Schweiks. Schweik is, of course, you know, one of the most important figures in Czech uh, literature, and it's Schweik. But there's also a dark version of, uh, and in this particular instance, of Czech Jewish humor, and that's Franz Kafka. Mm. Franz Kafka is a comedy author. And, of course, of the modern writers, Kundera and Harabal uh, would be two cases in point, and Havel's uh, place and... Uh, Essays would be another case in point. And of course, nobody was better at laughing in the face of totalitarianism than your close friend and the guy you wrote the book about, uh, you wrote his biography, Vaclav Havel. Was he a funny man privately? He had an incredible sense of humor, and that's why he was such a joy to be around. And uh, our senses of humor seemed to have matched, so we recognized that early in the day, and that's why we were so close for 30 years. But I saw his first play, The Garden Party, when I was 14 or 15, decades before I met him. And for us, it was a revelation. It uh, unveiled the absurdity of the system we were living in, in a very funny way. And we actually saw the play at that time seven or eight times. And uh, and knew it by heart. We could swap the lines and, uh, and had enormous fun doing it. So Havel made an enormous contribution to my education and to my generation's education even before uh, we ever met. Do you think it might be fair to say that the sound of democracy is laughter? The sound of democracy is an ability to laugh, is a freedom to laugh. This may, may be one of the paradoxes, you know, in a well-working democracy, there may not be so much to laugh about as in a bad, totalitarian, upset, insane system. That's where the laughter comes in as instrumental. Along with laughter, of course, another thing that the Czechs excel in is music. What is the relationship, do you think, between music 
and human agency and this will for self-governance, the love of democracy? I've never thought of uh, music as having anything directly to do with the democracy, but you may be right. I mean, the music in particular, the rock music of the 1960s, 1970s, played a very important political role in the history of the democratic opposition in Czechoslovakia during the communist times. And actually, the trigger for the emergence of the Charter 77 democratic movement was a trial with rock, uh, with a group of rock musicians. Who were terrible, right? Who were terrible. (laughs) Most of them were terrible. Some of them were not so ter- terrible. But they like a heavy metal band? In, no, it was worse. It was. The, <laughs> Is it something uh, worse than heavy metal? Yes, it was Frank Zappa on steroids. Oh my God, it, that is worse. Yeah, <laughs> it was alternative in the extreme. Heavy metal is very predictable and very structured compared to the music they performed. So, Michael, you lived through 1989, this great moment, turning 1968 literally upside down. What did that sound like? What did it look like? What are your memories of 89? Well, uh, it's a very difficult question, which I often get, but I'm terrified of it, because I was working as the Reuters correspondent in Prague. Three days into the revolution, I gave... Reuters my notice because I realized I was covering a story that I was partly involved in. Uh, so that's You wanted to go to the party. Yes. <laughs> so that's a no-no. And the next thing I knew, I was the spokesman for the Civic Forum, the umbrella group that uh, tried to organize the revolution. And a month later, I was a spokesman for President Havel when he was elected. And there were so many things going on every day, every night. We slept maybe two, three hours a day for weeks and weeks and weeks. And the outcome is that uh, today I have to look up some of the facts in histories and dictionaries because I have a, just a smudge. But I'm less interested in, in, a, in a factual narrative. I'm more interested in a kind of in your sensual memories, the sounds, the color, the noise, the food. Yeah, I know what you mean. And again, that calls for a considerable measure of emotional memory. And the problem was that we had no energy left for emotions. I mean, we were just trying to survive from one day to the other. So I do have small glimpses, small scraps of memory. One one of the most lasting for me was how the crowd, and there were quarter of a million Crowds. There were half a million crowds in Letna at the height of the Velvet Revolution. How it uh, behaved, uh, not as a crowd, but as a person. How it was able to show joint sensibility, even humor. There were people addressing the crowd from the podium And it was not a speech and an applause. It was a dialogue. I mean, the speaker said something. The crowd said something. The speaker said something funny. The crowd So it was like a rock concert. Like a very, very good rock concert. But didn't that scare you as a humorist, as a satirist, that everybody could agree in 89? Or it seemed as if in 89, everybody could agree. Did it ever cross your mind that we were to borrow an American conceit at the end of history? Well, no, it didn't, because it would have if the crowd was uh, screaming, you know, hang them up, stick them up loud. But they didn't. They were crying, we are not like them. You mean not like the Russians? Not like the communists, yeah? There was a lot of good feeling in the crowd, both here and in Slovakia, in Bratislava as well. There was no call for revenge or for... And maybe there was too much good feeling, and some people are still criticizing us for it, that uh, we were not tougher on the previous ancien regime and uh, 
didn't uh, jail people and so on and so on. Do you think the main achievement of 89 was democracy? Well, you know, for me, it depends on how you structure your worldview. I mean, for me, freedom comes before democracy. But aren't they the same thing? No. Democracy is a tool. Democracy is a way of going about things to protect and retain freedom. It's an integral part of what freedom is, but it's not the whole thing. But you can't have freedom without democracy, can you? No. No. So they are essentially the same thing. One is a system enabling something else. No, I would still uh, dispute that because democracy gives you the freedom and the ability to make decisions, to make your own decisions. Agency, again. Agency. But the decisions, that's the freedom. No democracy can tell you how to decide, right? So what has happened in the last 30 years in the Czech Republic between 89 and uh, and 2019? Have you been surprised with the progress or the lack of cultural, economic, political, existential progress in this country? Both. I mean, it's another paradox, and not for nothing has this uh, country been called absurdistan. I mean, the progress, the material progress, the physical progress of the country is more than we ever hoped for to achieve in 30 years. I mean, this, when you look at it today, is another European, prosperous, safe, democratic, mostly happy country. I mean, it's even featured in Hollywood movies like Spider-Man now. And it's even featured in Spider-Man and Mission Impossible. (laughs) And I mean, the film industry is part of the prosperity too. Would your old friend Harvel be turning in his grave? No, he would want to make a movie. I a mean, Spider-Man it was, movie? It was his dream all his life to make a movie. And, and actually, he wrote in 1969, after the Soviet invasion, he wrote a script uh, for a thriller movie, which was called Heartbreak. And it was about surgeons stealing people's hearts and selling them to, you know, very topical today. He could make it in 2019. But... Uh, in other ways, again, you know, we hope for much more progress than we've attained. Yeah, in all fairness, in all seriousness, Michael, did you expect the arrival of globalization, the inequality, the anger, the political fragmentation of that unified crowd from 89? Well, you know, we did expect a little of it. I mean, certainly one thing that we reacted to very early was uh, the Fukuyama thesis about the end of history. Mm. I mean, we did not feel that anything like that was uh, going to happen. And we didn't want it to happen because after 40 years of a complete absence of history, we were joining history and suddenly someone was telling us, this is the end of Mm. the thing, guys, you can go home. So we didn't believe it. We believe that the conflicts will continue in one way or another, and uh, they did. But we did believe in a, Havel believed in a decent society, in a society that would be able to contain its conflicts and discuss them in a Socratic manner, <laughs> but do you think in a civilized the- way. Do you think that the Czech Republic, for all its warts, is actually quite a positive example of a working democracy in contrast with some of your neighbors, particularly Hungary and Poland? I'm tempted to say yes, but I'm also cautious because the seeds of the malaise that seems to have infected Hungary and Poland present here as well in Slovakia, and in other European countries. Describe those. What do they look like to you here, those seeds? Well, the rhetorics about uh, elites, the... uh, Anti-elites. Yes. The rhetorics about uh, unnamed alien or foreign 
interests that uh, i.e. Jews uh, Jews Muslims oligarchs uh, Muslims uh, Soros mm. you know you name it that's enough of uh, targets to go around this absolutely absurd idea of uh, giving the Czech country back to the Czechs we have the country nobody's taken it away from us and discourse about who's Czech, who's not Czech. If you look at DNA data, if you look at our history, we are certainly large part Czechs, Slavic people, but also Celts, Celtic people, also German people, Jewish, Jewish people, Hungarian people. And I could go on and on and on. I Is mean, this new, what you call this germ, are they trying to do away with agency again? They trying to replace agency by prefabricated identity. And that, I think, is the most dangerous thing of all. Are they fascists? Um, no, they don't think of themselves as fascists. And thank God, I mean, few of them are thinking about uh, violent means of uh, attaining their goals. Uh, and, you know, this is not a very violent nation, never has been. So we mostly talk, and talking is something that uh, fascists are not best at, and other people are quite good at too. Michael, when you look outside the Czech Republic, when you look into the world, when you look at Orban in Hungary, uh, Putin in Russia, uh, Erdogan in Turkey, Trump in the United States, Boris Johnson in the UK, are you seeing the same thing in the terms of the germ you talked about, this cult of the real people and of a new kind of neo-authoritarianism? I would be very cautious to put them all in one basket. Certainly, to my knowledge, Boris Johnson does not talk in this kind of way. I mean, he may have other faults, but uh, he speaks like a conservative uh, Democrat, and uh, I hope and believe he is. Trump is uh, causing a problem for us all through his unpredictability and because you never know whether he means what he says and says what he means and then does something different. And the United States itself, I have an enormous respect. I've developed it in my five years over there for the American system of checks and balances and for the way... Which administration was in charge when you were the ambassador there? I came in at the end of Bush 41, and I was there through the first Clinton administration. Right. And uh, so Clinton had problems of his own, but uh, mm. uh, we all remember that. But my point is that I do believe that the system there is robust enough to survive Trump or any democratically elected president. Your generation made their name, you and your friends, mocking Russian bureaucrats or Russian totalitarians. What do you see when you look east now, when you see Putin? Well, it's a very, very strange animal. And, uh, and of course, the Russian system, although it calls itself democratic, is not democratic. It's an autocratic system. Putin controls many, many things, directly or indirectly. Still, it's not a totalitarian system. And maybe I'm an optimist here, but I think it does retain enough of uh, an openness to allow for change. And I just hope that the change comes sooner rather than later. It's Given your experience of, of fighting authoritarianism, what do you think you can teach people now resisting people like Putin? Is it humor? Michael, is that the most powerful weapon in the fight for democracy? Well, humor certainly has its place. It does have uh, an important place in the history of uh, Russian struggle against uh, anti-democratic or autocratic regimes. See Gogol, see Chekhov, see some of the modern Russian writers. But it's not enough. There's also a uh, Necessity for things like perseverance, hope, organization, organization, and communication, ability to communicate to other people. 
and this is all all hard work. But you know, we often use a rather wonderful quote by Havel, who wrote that hope is not a certainty that something will turn out well, but a belief that something has a meaning regardless of how it turns out. And in a giant and uh, rather desperate uh, country, you know, you have to have this kind of hope to just go through the day and wait for the next. But isn't there something almost sort of ironically Czech about the web of lies and deceit that men like Putin create? He's not Stalin, he's not a mass murderer, but he's a highly sophisticated liar and a a, a constructor of fabrication. It's almost as if he could have come from a play from Harvel or a novel from Kundera. Well, I don't think we would uh, want to claim (laughs) <laughs> he missed uh, our invention. I mean, uh, uh, Harwell, or, uh, he could have predicted this, couldn't he? Or... Mm, yes, and, and of course, we could again go all the way back to Franz Kafka right. and the trial. Exactly. And, uh, uh, but uh, let's admit that the Russians themselves have a time-honored tradition of uh, disinformation and inventing and spreading lies through the Tsarist secret police or the Bolshevik KGB. So I think they have very little to learn from us in this respect. Final question, Michael. We, we interviewed Madeleine Albright for this series, a number of other prominent East European activists. And one of the issues that's always come up is the role of technology in dissent. You didn't have the internet in 89. You didn't have the internet in 68. Do you think that the outcomes both of 68 and 89 would have been different had you had Facebook and Twitter and Google? Mm, I'm not sure. It's easy to speculate on this, but I think the important thing is for all such movements to always use uh, what's available in terms of technology. Remember the Iranian revolution in the late 1970s, they used tape cassettes with uh, preachings of Khomeini as uh, the weapon of communication. Yeah, I think he was operating a fax machine uh, in Paris at the time. And he was operating a fax machine. We were very lucky if we had a fax that we could use. Uh, Xerox was the latest call in technology, but most of the documents actually were spread by typing them over carbon papers into copies you could, at most you could fit 10 or 11 very thin papers with carbon copies into a manual typewriter. And so it took ages to spread a rather low number, but we did. So the role of technology is often exaggerated in the struggle for freedom and democracy. Absolutely. It's really about human beings. Absolutely. Because, you know, if you think of it, technology is uh, value neutral. It can be used to very good uh, ends, but it can also be used to spread disinformation, fake news, and some of the problems that we are struggling with at the moment in our modern age. You're listening to Keen on Democracy with your host, Andrew Keen. Hello, I'm Jason Sanderson, the producer of the show. Now we're about to take a quick break while we hear from our sponsors. Hi, my name is Steffi Czerny, and I'm the founder of the DLD Conferences. DLD is short for Digital Life Design and explores how the digital age fundamentally changes our world. Founded in Munich in 2005, DLD is now a globally connected community of thinkers, doers, and communicators. We host conferences in Munich, New York, Tel Aviv, Singapore, and Brussels. And we are very proud of our interdisciplinary outlook and even more so of our track record of discovering trend topics early on. Andrew Keane is a long-time, long-term DLD friend who has done many interviews at DLD conferences. If you like this podcast, you should join one of our events. Our motto for this year is optimism and courage. We want to put a really positive spin on recent technological developments from AI through blockchain to quantum computing and discuss which impact they have on business as well as politics and society. 
visit our website at dld.co and apply for your ticket. Now, we've got a real big favor that we need to ask. If you like this episode and you've been enjoying the other interviews, we'd sure love it if you headed over to the iTunes podcast app and leave us a review. If you'd like to hear more episodes, there's a subscribe button there and in all of the platforms like Spotify, Overcast and Google Play. So head over to one of those, subscribe, leave us a review, share it with your friends if you'd like, and we'd appreciate it so much. Be sure to check out our next episode every Thursday. And from all of us at Keenan Democracy, we hope you have a fantastic day.